afternoon, and welcome to Chamber's Business Beat Speaker Series. I'm Norm Becker, I'm Board Chair of the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining our virtual event today, the second of our four Business Beat events, allowing for the business community to hear directly from high-level experts and decision makers on timely and relevant topics. Today, we're talking New Mexico's finances and economy, ahead of what will be a very important 30-day legislative session that will begin next month. Our state's finances have been on an interesting roller coaster, with the latest projections pointing to record-breaking new revenues. Our budget is headed into territory it's never seen before, flush with state revenues and an influx of federal COVID relief money. Meanwhile, unemployment remains high, jobs are, are going unfilled across every sector in our economy, and there's a continued impact to COVID has created uncertainty for businesses, consumers, and workers alike. We're living in challenging times, and we're thankful today to have a legislative veteran and the state budget legend, I would say, David Abbey with us to help us make sense of it. Before we get started, however, I'd like to recognize some of the great companies and organizations who are sponsoring the speaker series. Starting off with PM Resources, Senior Vice President and CFO Don Terry, New Mexico Mutual, President and CEO Kelly Mixon, the University of New Mexico, Barnett Stokes, President, including UNM Health Sciences Center, UNM Health, UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center, UNM Athletics, and UNM Rainforest Innovations. Western Sky Care, Vice President Quinn Lopez, Comcast, Vice President Chris Duncanson, Bank of Albuquerque, New Mexico Market CEO Jennifer Thomas, and Senior U.S. Bank, Regional President Paul DePaulo, Central New Mexico Community College, President Terry Hartzler, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Mexico, President Janice Torres, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Executive Director Scott Heinemann, UNIRAC, CEO Peter Lorenz, French Funerals and Cremations, President and CEO Tom Antrim, Albertsons and Regional Vice President Travis Cheney, U.S. Federal Credit Union, President and CEO Marcia Majors, Fidelity Investments, Vice President of Public Affairs, Leanne Kravitz, Nusenda, President and CEO Joe Christian, Ultra Health CEO and President Duke Rodriguez, New Mexico Bank and Trust, President and CEO Gray Weindecker, and Payday HCM President Mike Stanford. Thank you so much to these great sponsors and these great companies for their engagement and their generos generosity. We deeply appreciate all of you. To begin the program today, we have a very special guest with us who we'll hear from, who we'll hear from for just a few minutes prior to David Abbey's presentation. Jerry Cole, our president and CEO, will introduce him. Jerry, are you there? Yes, thank you, Norm. Good afternoon. It's great to be with everyone today. Yes, we're talking about the regular legislative session. But as luck would have it, there's a special legislative session happening in Santa Fe right now. Lawmakers have descended on the Capitol for the once in a decade task of redrawing district boundaries following the completion of the census. In the past, it's been quite a contentious process, and don't let anyone fool you. Once it's in the lawmakers' hands, it's a very political undertaking. So to learn the very latest about this redistricting special session, we thought we'd invite the Albuquerque Journal's Capitol Bureau Chief to our meeting today to talk with us for a few moments. Live from Santa Fe, Dan Boyd is here. Hello, Dan. Dan, hey, Terry. what's happening? Hey, what's happening in the roundhouse right now? How is the redistricting process going? I'm I'm here right now in the, the roundhouse media office. It's the third day of the, the special session on redistricting. Uh, we're starting to see some some action, some movement, certainly uh, some tempers starting to, to flare a little bit. Um, the latest updates today, the the Senate, a Senate committee voted on a party line to advance a, a proposal to redraw the, the congressional district boundaries. Um, and in the House side, they, our, our committee passed a, a proposal to redraw um, the map for the state house districts. So both of those still are moving through the committee process, but uh, moving pretty quickly. Um, 
you know, for this stage of the game, certainly in both chambers, Democrats have a majority. Um, so far, we've seen party line votes with Republicans voting against both of those redistricting proposals. Um, but Democrats, you know, like I said, have the majorities in both chambers. There's a Democratic governor. So we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I know that there's going to be heartburn even within the caucuses, but it seems like there's a, a path for Democrats to kind of, uh, you know, move fairly quickly on these maps. Thanks, Dan. So uh, the first question I had for you has had to do with sort of what you just described. And, you know, the last couple of sessions we've had on redistricting, we've had a Republican governor and Democratic-led uh, House and Senate. This time, we've got a Democrat-led uh, leadership in all three places. So do you think it's going to be more contentious? And, you know, getting right to the point of it, do you think those maps will be fairly slanted in favor of the Democrats? What's your take on the pure politics of the situation? I think it, it still will be a contentious process, even with that democratic control. Um, you know, every all legislators are kind of looking out for their own districts here as well. So it's certainly partisan interest, but also just kind of uh, each legislator for themselves. Um, you know, I think that's a big part of it as well. The dynamics are different, you know, from 10 years ago or even from 20 years ago. So I think that could make it easier to get some of these bills to the governor's desk and get them signed. But I don't think that means we won't see, you know, potentially any uh, court challenges to the maps, um, you know, as to whether the maps are slanted or not. I think that probably depends on your uh, political perspective. And um, but already we're hearing, you know, claims of gerrymandering in Democratic in Democrats' favor. Um, you know, they, they certainly dispute that. But I, I think that's something to keep an eye out for. How, how drastic of changes are made to kind of the current status quo. You know, Dad, just as an aside, it's kind of fun asking you questions for a change. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm not used to it. I'm used to being the one asking the questions. I know, I just thought I would tell you I'm having a moment of joy about that. So um, moving back to some other questions I had. So we had an independent redistricting commission, uh, which we used, I believe this is the first time ever, to provide recommendations. Uh, how much deference do you think the lawmakers are going to give to their work? They certainly put a lot of work into it and um, the leadership I thought uh, that they uh, demonstrated was very, very, um, very good, very productive. What do you think? I, I think, yeah, I think it's too early to tell for sure, um, you know, how exactly how much deference will be given to those uh, independent redistricting committees maps. I think they have been a starting place for the legislature. I've heard, you know, uh, legislators say that, that uh, the public pro the public input they got, the maps they came up with have kind of been a starting place. Um, but already we're starting to see some changes. Uh, the congressional map that was uh, introduced um, by Senator Cervantes and Representative Lewis, um, that's already moving ahead. You know, that's similar to one of the maps that was advanced by the redistricting committee, but has a few changes to it. So as you mentioned earlier, once it's here in the roundhouse, it's, it's up to the legislature. Um, I think we'll we'll see how much, and I think there's been some skepticism about how much deference they would give to the the committee. Um, I think certainly if they end up doing their own thing, that will, um, you know, I, I think some people will be rubbed the wrong way by that. Um, but like I said, I, I think it's too early to tell for sure, you know, what these final maps are going to look like. You know, it is interesting that some of our uh, current legislators live a block and a half away from each other in their districts. And when you said there was a lot of self-interest in the hearings I've listened to, I certainly saw that. And it's understandable. You know, no legislator is going to want to run against the person who they live down the street from or sit uh, in a down the hall from in the Capitol. So how many legislators do you think will be faced with that uh, dilemma? Yeah, all, already under the, the House map that was advanced would uh, would pair four different kind of sets of incumbents. Um, so we're talking about eight legislators there. A few of those folks have already said they're not running for re-election next year, so that makes it a little easier. Um, but we did see some pairing uh, 10 years ago. I think it's kind of inevitable when you're trying to shift boundary lines based on population changes. And there are some representatives, like you said, who live in, in close proximity. Um, but I think everyone's trying to be that legislator who doesn't get paired in a different district. Um, you know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes about 
even when it comes down to certain precincts or neighborhoods and legislators wanting to keep them or, um, you know, so I, I think we will see some of that pairing. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to minimize as possible just to kind of avoid having, um, you know, elections next year kind of pitting two different incumbents against each other. Yeah, I have uh, time, I think, for one more question. So the chamber is interested in a process that produces competitive districts as much as possible in New Mexico. And I'm wondering what you think about whether there'll be more or fewer competitive seats uh, when this whole process is over. I think, uh, at least in the congressional map so far, it's looking like it could make all three of the districts more competitive, um, which would be interesting. Um, as far as the legislative ones, you know, that's maybe a little harder to make generalizations about. I think certainly there is some incumbents want to keep some safe uh, seats for themselves as well. Um, but when it comes to Congress, I, I think it, it could be interesting to see all three districts that are a little bit more competitive. Uh, I don't know that they would be necessarily swing districts, but it would be uh, you know more interesting for us as covering some of these races, certainly. And, and like you said, I think for um, voter engagement as well. Um, yeah, a positive. Yes, you know, from our perspective, we like to see a little more fight for the middle, because generally, we think the solutions are better. Uh, but that's, you know, my editorial comment for the morning, the afternoon. So Dan, I've got to move on now, but I want to thank you for being here. I know how busy you are and uh, we watch you. You do great work and we'll be keeping up with you as uh, we go through the process. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I'll, I'll stick around and listen to some of David's comments too. Oh yeah, I'm sure you'll be interested. Me too. Back to you, Norm. Thank you, Terry. Our featured speaker is David Abbey, director of the New Mexico Legislative Finance Committee. Here with us for the second straight year. We always appreciate him. He'll give us some insight into New Mexico's fiscal and economic future. On behalf of the legislature, David oversees the construction of the budget each year, keeps legislators apprised of local fiscal and economic developments in the state, and leads a staff of program evaluators who analyze the effectiveness of various programs in state government. David has led the LFC for over 20 years. Previously, he was the Chief Investment Advisor for the State Treasurer, Director of the Board of Finance, and DFA's Chief Economist. Before entering state government, he worked at Los Alamos Nest, last, excuse me, National Laboratory, where he researched the environmental impacts of energy policy. David has a bachelor's degree in economics from Brown University. David is recognized as a steady hand and is widely respected by Republicans, Democrats alike in the legislature. After David, he'll take some questions from, from you. Uh, so during the presentation, if you'd like to pose a question, please type in in the Q&A box on your screen and we'll get to as many as we can. David? Um, so uh, next slide, I'm gonna talk about the revenues first, then the operating budget, and finally, non-recurring revenue, including capital outlay. Uh, slide three, page three. This is just staggering in many ways. This is, we talk in our business about new money every year, new money representing next year's estimated revenues, 90, 49, 9 billion, almost 50 million, minus this year's spending, seven and a half billion. So that's $1.6 billion for this year's spending. Even in the last revenue estimate last week, that went up a couple hundred million. I mean, this is staggering. And I'll just as an aside mention, when I started my career in 1983 under Governor Anaya, the state's budget was 870 million. So we're looking at tenfold growth over my career. Uh, oil and gas is driving this windfall mostly, along with a lot of federal revenue. The, the second bullet there, oil and gas, it accounts for 20% of the increase, revenue increases in 22 and 60% in FY23. Uh, next slide. Well, again, this is incredible to me. For 30 years of my career, uh, oil production, New Mexico was sixth, fifth in oil production, uh, producing about 200,000 barrels a day. Now we're producing a million and a half barrels a day. 
we are the second largest producer in the nation. We've overtaken North, North Dakota, long ago overtaken Oklahoma, California, even Alaska. So the second largest producer, and, and just looking at this slide, almost half as much as Texas. And also of interest, everybody's, all states production collapsed when the pandemic hit. Remember, drilling collapsed, we, we had 115 rigs going, it fell to 20. Prices collapsed, they were negative one day. Production fell off sharply everywhere, but New Mexico came roaring back in the Permian Basin, and now we're well ahead of the pre-pandemic level, unlike all the other states which are still behind. So, you know, that promises a great benefit for our state finances. And prices are, have, are pretty healthy, uh, $68, $69 right now in New Mexico compared to an average of $30 uh, a year and a half ago. So strong revenues, strong production, but also some interesting warning signs. So even while there's strength in the... Um, oil fell $10 the day after Thanksgiving, and it gained some of it back, lost it again, gained some of it back, but it is a very strong reminder of what legislators have experienced in the last few decades about volatility of oil and gas that has caused them to be a special cautious, especially cautious in budgeting. You know, many of them, whether they came in 10 years ago or two years ago, they described one of their first votes being to cut the budgets and how they don't want to do that again. So, so let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, this is the whipsaw that legislators have experienced over the last year. I initially left this out, and thank you, uh, Sarah and others, for Kelsey for helping me bring this in. You know, this is not really the way to run a railroad with this kind of volatility in budgeting. You know, plus 13 one year, minus 11 the next year. In the last 15 years, four or five downturns and upturns making it very hard to have a responsible fiscal climate for investment to get the results we know we want. Um, next slide, please. In some ways, the situation in the last five years, the state has really introduced some budget budgeting concepts that partly come from looking at other states that promise some greater stability. And I'll, I'll just, in simple terms, call it the Laranyaga bills. There were a couple different ones over a few years. And, and the concept was rather than spend all the new money every year, let's budget only the previous five years average. Let's chop off the peaks and put it in a trust fund somewhere. And this is an interesting chart. It, it shows how much chopping off those peaks represents for, for state finances over the last four or five years. So incredibly, this early childhood trust fund, which we thought might get to be a billion dollars sometime in four or five years, well, it's heading to three billion at the end of next year. Three billion. I think there are certainly questions about, do we need that much earmarked to early childhood? We've poured so much money already into early childhood. We're close to universal four-year-old pre-K a lot of money poured into childcare, almost as much as we can use for home visiting, all good things, how much more do we need? But I, in some ways, the greatest benefit of this, these measures, the Laranyaga bills, is not so much setting up a trust fund that'll send money to uh, you know, good purposes, but causing the legislature to, to not budget all the windfall revenue from oil and gas that we all kind of know is not recurring. We see it go up and we see it go down. We had the president of Conoco in to see legislators in the fall. And you know, oil was already 65 and he said we should budget around 50. Well, we're higher than that. But the point is the oil companies are budgeting conservatively. The state should do that and the state shouldn't spend all the money we get when we see these peaks. So all that to me is a good thing. Uh, let's go to page, next slide. This is in a way the same thing. You know, if you count the permanent funds, 43% of 
of revenues are coming from oil and gas. Of course, we'll get the permanent fund money where the oil and gas goes up and down. But for next fiscal year, only 31% of the revenues are coming from oil and gas. If we didn't have the Laranyaga bills, that would be 38%. And we'd wonder whether that was sustainable. So, so this between half minutes, over 30% is the target. And not spending all the so-called recurring revenues, not spending all the windfall, to say nothing of setting money aside in other places like the Early Childhood Trust Fund that we can tap on if we have a downturn. Certainly that positions us to have greater stability going forward than we had for the last decade. Well, I haven't talked much about the broad-based economy because oil and gas is driving this. Let's go to the next slide. You know, this these percentage changes on the right are changes in jobs depending on income level. So overall, New Mexico's um, still overall down from pre-pandemic levels, but at the highest wage level, over 60,000, we're up 16%. Middle wage up 15%. We're still down 18% at the lower wage levels. So uh, part of the point here is to make, make the proposition that New Mexico is substantially at full employment. And certainly in the United States, that's the case. You know, unemployment has fallen to 4.6%. You know, that we've known that since August when there was a lot of discussion about how, how to hire workers. When we, all the conversation about bottlenecks and supply chains are about that we can't find workers to expand production uh, to meet demand. Well, in a way, New Mexico, especially at the higher income levels, has also reached that full employment level, perhaps less so at the lower income, lower wage skill levels. Uh, next slide. Why does that matter for government? It met, well, this is the same data. It shows total employment in New Mexico grew 4% year over year, October this year to last year, but government employment declined 2.7%. You know, I don't know that this is a terrible problem. You know, government is functioning. There's a lot of money, but my point is we're in a position as we face all this financial opportunity, we're not in a position to hire workers to do the work in government. So. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Before I get to spending, one more thing about revenue. I can tell you in a general way without being too specific. LFC recommendations will leave a significant amount, hundreds of millions, to address uh, uh, the state's tax structure uh, and make it make a more favorable environment for business development and economic growth. Some of the things talked about, the governor came out with a quarter percent reduction in the gross receipts tax. That's something LSC will look at and bring to the full legislature next month. Anti-pyramiding, you know, we have some service sectors where the effective tax rate is approaching 20%. So anti-pyramiding in effect allows businesses to deduct in that second bullet to deduct gross receipts taxes charged on sales to other businesses, which should help our comp competitiveness in certain sectors. Some one-time rebates, so folks are still nervous about revenues not staying up. If they, we can probably afford rebates now and maybe not afford permanent tax reductions and then revisit it next year, see where we are and some other minor changes. So I'm gonna to turn to the budget now on the next slide. One more. State agencies came in on September 1st and they asked for an average increase of 20%. And you know some of these increases were pushing 50% or 70% in certainly areas that you probably would applaud like economic development and tourism. But again, in a context where the state is at full employment, LFC had a lot of testimony throughout the fall as we heard these requests that agencies were struggling to retain the employment levels they had much less hire additional people. We think that the budgets have enough money to, to, to cover about 90 million of spending on employees. And yet they asked to hire in their request 2,200 more employees. And we think they're gonna struggle pretty much to keep flat. So 
uh, that that's the backdrop of the budget request. On Monday, LSC adopted a spending recommendation that we'll bring to the session. It'll be made public on January 6th, the day after the governor's uh, recommendation comes out. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. I'll talk about it a little bit in a general way. Well, uh, one more slide, please. This is a little more on pay. And I can imagine many of you in the Chamber of Commerce, you know, wonder, we certainly hear it from legislators worrying about government pay getting out of whack. But this history shows the government pay for state government, which includes public schools, includes higher ed, that we've fallen behind over the last decade. And so because of that oil and gas roller coaster, many years the gray bars represent when the state offered raises. And you know they generally ranged from one to four. While the private sector was more stable uh, in the US in the range two to three percent, and in New Mexico, maybe a little more volatility in the range one to four percent. So this is an example of the states falling behind on pay, and and we need to catch up just to retain the workers we have, not necessarily to expand employment. Um, the governor came out with a recommendation of seven percent for next fiscal year for public employees. Keep in mind that in June of 20, when oil and gas collapsed in the wake of the pandemic, the raises were rolled back from 4% and eliminated except for workers under 1.5%. So part of next year's 7% is just recovering something that was rolled back in the pandemic. And again, a lot of this is defending the employees we have, like teachers. It's a well-known figure that's been publicized in the last few months that we're short about a thousand teachers in New Mexico. That's about 5%. Well, that's a problem if teachers, if we can't get teachers in the classroom. It's a problem if we can't get social workers to investigate cases, or if we can't process applications for changes in uh, water use permits the state engineer's office, or if folks have to wait too long at the motor vehicle office to get, get their transactions done. So my point isn't to advocate in a big expansion of government and an increase in employment, but to point out there are areas that if we can't retain the people we have, we're going to productivity is going to suffer and public services and public safety are going to suffer. I, I, I'll throw out also state police. You know, they are, are we, we, for reasons of public safety, Cities, the state police would like to add at least 50, maybe 100 more officers, and they're struggling to keep the ones we have. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the LFC recommendation, not in detail. It'll come out, uh, as I said, on January 6th. But some of, that's, some of it has been discussed already in the press, and I'll elaborate. We'll have a double digit increase recommended in spending more than 10%. But of that, 5% is to backfill, to, you, to replace non-recurring funds used in building the budget in FY22. The biggest chunk of that backfilling is in Medicaid. The federal government sent us about $250 million to enhance the mat, federal match for Medicaid and save general fund. And they did that because they didn't want states cutting Medicaid at a, a difficult time because of the, the health crisis and the pandemic. So the budget for the current year saved 250 million. Our budget for FY23 needs to restore the 250 million. So that's about 4%. You know, there are other areas that are more modest. Uh, we need rate increases for, for solvency for our health insurance funds. We use one-time monies in public schools and at the Children, Youth, and Families Department. So again, about 5% of the general fund increase is to replace one-time monies in the budget. The LSC targets reserves at at least 30%. That's outstanding, given the, oil, the volatility of oil and gas. It's, the government's job is not to collect money in taxes and let it sit there in an unproductive way, but the, the roller coaster ride doesn't either the lack of stability in budgeting doesn't help 
the pub serve the public well. So we want a better cushion because of the dependence on oil and gas. Some of the other things that are very important and, and even exciting in budget making is the opportunity to eliminate the waiting list for services for, for the developmentally disabled. We have 5,000 Mexicans who are on the waiting list. And we think, especially because of the federal funds uh, coming in from uh, federal measures that have passed in the last year and a half, we can serve those 4,500 people and uh, also raise provider rates to make sure we have a network to provide them. Um, criminal justice will have a strong increase in salaries for law enforcement, as well as trying to increase the, the ranks of the state police. And especially in education, I want to flag a strong public school budget with both raises to address the problem of retention and recruitment, recruitment, but also continuing the push for extended learning. And I don't have a slide on this, but every year I remind you that our reading math proficiency for third graders is about 30%. And for disadvantaged groups, it's as low as 10%. 10% proficient in some school districts. And that's why we got sued. And money doesn't solve everything, but the courts ruled that we needed to make stronger investments and promote accountability and try to turn out around that performance, which which is, is doesn't bode well for our economic prospects decades from now. I'll put it put in a plug at this point for Kurt Steinhaus, the new PED secretary. He's a former colleague. I've served with him on, on boards, the Public School Capital Outlay Council. He's a, been a superintendent. He's taught at Alamogordo schools. He knows our state well. He's a native New Mexican. Uh, we see great leadership and are optimistic about his leadership in the public school arena. But we've got to, of all the things, not only are, is our proficiency low, it's probably deteriorating because of the pandemic. It's what we call lost learning time. It's deteriorating. If we Texas uh, test more than we do in New Mexico, we've fallen off on testing. And Texas is, has a demonstrable decline in student performance in the early grades and at every grade level. I saw a stat the other day from public education, 30% of students in high school have excessive tardy, tardiness. Again, doesn't bode well for uh, students attending uh, UNM and other institutions. So LFC will continue the push for extended learning times. It's not real popular, but in my view, the leadership of the private sector should be demanding that accountability and investment and participation. You know, we've got enough money to fund 10 days for every kid, including in professional development can be some of that. We've got enough money to fund the early grades for every school that wants to participate an extra five weeks. And that's just alone to make up for the lost learning time during the pandemic. We need to make those investments. Um, all right. Non-recurring, the, the, the last piece of this, sometimes called pork. And we have, one more slide, please. One more, non-recurring and capital outlay. We have an unprecedented amount of funding available for one-time expenses. And, and that is on, in, in an environment where the state has billions of dollars unspent and has started projects that are unfinished. And you've heard me talk about that year after year. So this, this slide here shows uh, outstanding are 3,652 projects that have been appropriated in the last four years, worth about 1.8 billion. And if you add public schools, it's gonna exceed 2 billion unspent. Well, the needs are there, we know. The appetite is there. I don't know about the ability to put the money to work, but let's go to the next slide. Here's what the legislature will look at at the regular session and to some extent at the special session. So if we want to have general fund reserves at 30 percent, well, we have over a billion dollars in general fund over the 30 percent that could be used for for non recurring purposes. We have over a billion in the conventional capital outlay sources like severance tax bonds and general obligation bonds. And finally, we have a billion of the so-called ARPA money. 
that was the subject of the litigation between some senators and the governor about who has authority to spend that money. So in, in round numbers, two and a half billion, that we know the needs are there, the ability to get the money out the door is in question. LSC has a framework to spend that, all of the money. In August, when LSC adopted budget recommendations, Senator Munoz said, let's start planning for it now. Let's not wait. And in fact, even if you look at last session, uh, the legislature and Senate finance amendments authorized spending about 600 million of that money that was vetoed. And so much of that will come back and do things like ensure full funding of the lottery for the next five years. That would cost 100 to 150 million. And you'll see that in January. And that's a good thing to, to, that students know they can enter college as freshmen next year and that every year it'll be covered rather than some years it hasn't been long when they'd only get 65 cents on the dollar of their, their tuition costs. Some of the, separately from all this money that the legislature has to appropriate, there are billions more of ARPA money, federal funds in the infrastructure bill that the state can get through a grant application process. And that includes about 100 million per year per more of road funding. It includes money for airports, for charging stations, for cleaning up abandoned wells. So in the state appropriations, both this week at the special session and in January, you'll see proposals to supplement that federal funding that is vast. Let's go to the next page. I'll talk a little bit about the things that we know we need to do. You'll see uh, requests and recommendations, I'm sure, for close to a half a billion of road funding. You know, it happens that both my chairs come from Gallup to, to go to, to come to sessions at the Capitol. And one of them flies, but they drive some of the time. Both one drives all the time. And anybody who's been to Gallup wouldn't be surprised to hear about a three hour wait on the highway, whether it's Laguna or Continental Divide. We've got to make that I-46 lanes and it's going to bottleneck the roads, but investments that need to happen. We need to re rebuild the a state veterans hospital. That'll cost about 60 million, although the federal government will pay 40 million of that. Public safety radios. UNM is proposed a new science center for collaborative arts and technology next to uh, you know, they're, they're performing arts center and they can look forward to 40 million or more to, for a state match for that project. The Children's Psychiatric Hospital at UNM is 50 years old. It'll cost $40 million to replace that. I think UNM can count on much of that in recommendations from uh, the legislature. And I think the governor to replace that hospital that in many ways isn't even safe by today's standards. Anima Shu has an engineering building to repair or replace in an education building, senior centers, libraries, a lot of important work to be done. Uh, the end of my prepared remarks, briefly on the special session. Thank you, David. Oh, can I say one more thing about special session? Yes, of course, of course, of course. Briefly. Of course. Briefly, in a way, a cardinal rule of budget making is don't piecemeal, don't earmark, you know, don't do things in bits and pieces. Look at all the need, needs in a unified way and prioritize by bringing all the money in, in, in a way that balances the competing demands. Now, of course, these, the federal government is anxious for the state to get this ARPA money. 1.8 billion of which 600 million already went to the unemployment trust fund. The federal government is anxious for the state to get going on that. Nine months have passed. Some of it was vetoed. Well, LSC will advance a plan to spend all that money per the guidelines. We've been working on it all fall. There was some surprise that that became a special session agenda item. But the good news from a legislative point of view is that we're prepared to quickly pivot to take the LFC recommendation for January and bring that into a plan that I think so far is getting, I hope, pretty good acclaim. Uh, it's, touching, it's touching a lot of different sectors of the state and 
addressing a lot of needs. So the idea is spend a third to a half of that ARPA money at special session, knowing come January, it needs to be coordinated with all of the budget making. So that's where we are right now. Um, the bills in the House have moved to the Senate. And so far, from my point of view, it's pretty, uh, pretty a growing consensus about where the legislature's at, maybe some tweaks in the next day or so. So thank you, Terry and Norm and others, and I'll stop there. Thank you, David. We do have a few more minutes. I was going to ask you about redistricting. So how long do you think this session is going to last? Um, or is this all going to be over maybe Monday, do you think, or sooner? I think this is a, is a good target. You know, they start out thinking two weeks. And I think it's, it, I think uh, we heard from Dan Boyd kind of a recognition that in many ways they kind of know what they they're ready to do and they're moving faster than was thought and certainly the budget can be done within that time frame the arpa budget great thanks very much well fantastic presentation all this information is so helpful to businesses across the state david and as we all continue to do what we can to help new mexico grow and thrive and uh it's just always wonderful to be with you thanks for your leadership it's just uh terrific to have you in the state of new mexico and the role you play so thank you so much uh we do have yeah i hope i didn't go too long i thought i had a close to half an hour but i have time for questions if you have some yes Okay, great. Thank you. No, you didn't go uh, too long. We do have a few questions. Our first question, uh, we're pleased to have the University of New Mexico President Garnet Stokes with us, David. And um, uh, President Stokes, you know, I just am always so impressed with the work you do and your leadership at the university. We're lucky to have you too. So thanks for being here. And you're up now. I understand you have a question for David. I do. Thank you, Terry. What, thank you for your kind words and great to see you, Director Abby. Uh, the recommendations. I just want to say thank you for that and your leadership. I do want to especially point out uh, uh, my thanks to you for the focus on pay competitiveness. I know that's an issue for state government, um, but you know how important it's been for higher education as well. And so thank you for that. It's really crucial for our competitiveness at UNM. But I wanna ask a question kind of on a matter that we haven't really had to think about very much. And uh, that, uh, you know, I'm getting some, you know, seeing some input from the Bureau of Business and Economic Research. Uh, some of the economists that hang out around UNM uh, are raising some substantial concerns about how deeply inflation could erode the spending power of our additional revenues. And uh, I think we're looking at maybe 5% inflation right now and perhaps increasing. And I can see that taking a pretty big chunk out of projected revenue increases. And at UNM, as we are doing our planning for, uh, via our budget leadership team and thinking about tuition and what increases we might need, I was wondering if LFC is forecasting anything uh, about inflation or whether you see this as an issue for FY23. Just really interested in your thoughts about this issue and its importance for us. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a big deal. And I, I look quickly, the forecast for inflation for 22 is 5%, but then it falls to Uh, it falls to two percent and twenty-three. The the consensus forecast, and and I think we absolutely worry that there's some wishful thinking about that. And I'm sure the Federal Reserve is worried about wishful thinking on inflation. And we know already they're they're phasing out sooner buying, you know, and growing the money supply by by their bond buying program. And from a revenue point of view, inflation won't actually be bad for state revenue you know it oil prices might go up ener energy wages and salaries will get more revenue but then we'll be falling behind on spending and not getting the gains we hoped we had achieved and and the desire to catch up on the periods we missed and so if inflation was didn't slow down from five percent then the seven percent which we think really helps our competitiveness restores it 
isn't going to do it. Unfortunately, I think it's hard for a legislature that meets 30 days next year to be nimble to fix that, and given the uncertainty. So it's just a risk of not achieving the gains we want. Uh, it's, I think it's pretty hard to sell higher higher salary increases than the 7% that's being talked about other than ones that are targeted. But if you're, if, if their worries about inflation are realized, it won't, it'll, it'll be, we won't get what we want to get. It's, it's worrisome. And thank you, uh, President Stokes for that good question. Um, David, we've got a couple more questions. I know you have a hard stop at four o'clock, so we're going to respect that. So a couple more questions come in. Um, one question is tied to the gross receipts tax, and the, the statement is that we all, or most people agree, the gross receipt, receipt, receipts tax um, hurts our competitive. So two parts to the question. One is the quarter percent that you mentioned. Um, is that the best we can do, or could we afford to bring the rate down further? And then the second part is, do you anticipate any significant work to tackle gross receipt tax pyramiding this session? Well, so the, the LSC staff will recommend close to $100 million for anti pyramiding along with the rate reduction. And, you know, the full committee hasn't taken that up. But uh, I think in some quarters, there's pretty good recognition the need to address that. So when you add anti pyramiding, uh, I think, and, and the, the lingering anxiety about two big recurring tax reductions. Uh, the quarter might be kind of near the best we can do this session, but I don't think anybody thinks that's the end of it. And and I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion next interim about continuing to study the tax system. And if the if the revenue has to hold an oil and gas hold up, there'll be an opportunity to do more at a 23 session. Okay, uh, another question that came in, and, and you talked about student proficiency, which is a very big deal to all of us uh, for our, our kids and our businesses too. Um, a shining star has been the success of charter schools. Um, do you agree that there's a large gap between the quality of school facilities for the traditional school districts and, and uh, the charter schools? And given the monies available to lawmakers this coming year, is now the time to create a loan fund that would support construction projects for public charter schools? Uh, I don't. I don't, I, that's a hard question. And I'm on the public school capital. Uh, you know, in places like Santa Fe, Santa Fe does a pretty good job allocating their property tax base to, to charter schools. And we've done a good job in Santa Fe and other places, not so much. So I think it's an issue. I, I don't uh, have a view on the solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question just came in. Um, we've heard a lot about the need to get broad band to all areas of the state. How much of the ARPA funds and the capital outlay do you expect to be allocated to broadband construction? So House Bill 2 has a special session sponsored by Representative Lundstrom that they heard yesterday has 150, 25 million uh, in it for broadband on top of about 140 million that passed at last year's regular, regular session which is largely unspent, and on top of more federal funds available and coming in. So just in the last few weeks, a new broadband director was hired by the executive. We desperately need that leadership to get the program going. The money's there, but the plan is we're short of. Okay, thank you. Um, Terry, did you have one final question before we wrap up here? Uh, no, I'm good. I think we're ready to um, move to Janice, Norm, okay. so we stay on time. And I also know that David's got to go, so we want to try to get him moving. Again, David, thank you so much for joining us today. You are absolute treasure for our state. We're so lucky to have you. Um, and we also thank, thank you for your candor, um, as always. It's always, it helps us understand more clearly what challenges are and, and what we're working with. And the best of luck to you in this particular session, also in the 2022 session. So to wrap up our event today, I'm gonna to pass it over to Janice Torres, um, president of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Mexico for some closing comments and a preview of what's coming next. Janice has been with Blue Cross Blue Shield for the last 13 years, now serves as president. We're so happy to have her as one of our board members. Janice, will you wrap it up? 
Certainly. Thank you, Norm. And I want to echo your comments. That was an incredible question. Uh, you know, it's so important for business leaders to stay engaged on legis legislative topics and on the budget in particular, because what's happening with our budget impacts our economic development and economic growth. Um, when we're flush with cash, we should see it as an opportunity, definitely an opportunity to save a lot so that we can weather the next downturn, an opportunity to fully fund our important safety net programs like Medicaid so that they're not shortchanged later, and an opportunity to solve our infrastructure challenges, roads, bridges, water systems, public safety, because these large scale investments aren't affordable much of the time otherwise an opportunity to bring down taxes in a meaningful pro-growth way and starting with the job killing gross receipts tax is key and an opportunity to shore up our economic development incentives so that oil and gas it doesn't impact our ability to re recruit new companies and jobs businesses do want to locate and operate in states with budget stability that's hard to come by in New Mexico, but through proper saving, restrained spending, and wise investments, we can create a stable economic environment. And I know our chamber will be fighting for exactly that over the next couple of months. So on behalf of the chamber, we would once again like to thank these great sponsors for our business beat speaker series, P&M, UNM, New Mexico Mutual, French Funerals and Cremations, Unirac, Western Sky Community Care, Blue Cross Blue Shield and New Mexico, Comcast, Albertsons, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Bank of Albuquerque, Fidelity Investments, U.S. Eagle Federal Credit Union, Lucinda Credit Union, New Mexico Bank and Trust, Payday HCM, U.S. Bank, CNM, and Ultra Health. We want to thank everyone for attending today's second installment of the 2021, 2021 and 2022 Business Beat Speaker Series. Our next event in the series won't be until March when we welcome Senator Martin Heinrich virtually. Sales on our upcoming events as they approach. Our next chamber event is in person. We will have our annual meeting next month on January 11th at the Marriott Pyramid. The luncheon will feature Mayor Tim Keller as our keynote speaker. To request a ticket or a table, please send an email to the address currently on your screen. This concludes our event today. Thanks again for joining and we'll see you all soon.